We're going to the book of Romans, chapter 12. What I want to do is look into Romans, chapter 12. I'm going to finish this chapter. And then in our, what we call our Q&A, but uh, more my just uh, addressing certain issues, I want to talk about some matters related to what we were discussing in our morning topic, uh, relating to the believer and resurrection, in particular, uh, the condition between um, the death of a believer and the resurrection of the body. Uh, some matters related to that, so we'll talk about that in our discussion time after. But we've been Romans chapter 12, and basically we move through what we call the doctrinal section of the book, uh, and now Paul talks more about the application of that doctrine. Now, it's true that application and doctrine are woven and interwoven through the book of Romans and other books as well. But the more greater emphasis in the first 11 chapters has been on explaining the doctrinal foundation, biblical truth. And that understanding is the foundation for how we be behave, how we conduct ourselves. Um, often the problem in evangelical churches is there's more of an emphasis on talking about what we ought to do how we ought to conduct ourselves, which is important. But if we don't give enough attention to the biblical foundation for such a life, it can become rather subjective. And we who are pastors and others who are teachers have to be careful about that, where we spend more of our time telling people what they ought to do and how they ought to conduct themselves or what they shouldn't do. Uh, than we do on setting the doctrinal foundation out of which, if I can put it this way, naturally is to come the conduct. If I am now a child of God, enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, of course my life ought to be different. And the scripture unfolds what that is. So Paul is setting that out. And he began chapter 12 by what is the foundational principles. Our lives are not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies, as he puts it in another letter. Here he puts, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. A sacrifice which is holy and well-pleasing to God. Um, we're not to be conformed to this world. I mean, spending the first, uh, as we have it, 11 chapters of this uh, instructional letter to the Roman church, well, of course, our life ought to be different. We ought to be conformed to the world. He has transformed us. Um, he has broken the power of sin. We died with Christ. We were raised with Christ to new life. Uh, his life now lived out. Uh, and then on into the instruction. He, when he saved us, he brought us together as a body of believers. So we could function together as the body of Christ in each place where their local churches meet. And he has provided the gifts and we work through that. You see, this is foundational. How can people who claim to be believers say they don't think they need to be part of a local church? I mean, that's where if we don't have the doctrinal foundation correct, then we're just out here spinning around with our own ideas and subjective ways of thinking. This is God's plan for our growth. All the parts of the body working together enable the body to grow. And the individual members of the body grow by the contribution that all the parts of the body make. The natural analogies we've seen with our physical body. And then when he talked, uh, then he talked specifically about our relationship together as believers. Verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love in verse 10 and so on. In verse 14, he touched on something. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And then he went on to talk about primarily our relationship to one another as believers. Uh, but 
that statement, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, uh, relates primarily to those, obviously, who are not believers who are going to be persecuting us. And uh, we're not to react in the same way. But then he went on in verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, be of the same mind with one another, verse 16. But now with verse 17, he's going to go back and elaborate on what he just mentioned in verse 14. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Um, and he comes back, you know, we have to be careful. We are a body of believers. We ought to manifest that. We are God's family in this place. And we Talked about that and stress it. But we do have to deal with an unbelieving world around us. We are placed in this world at this time. And it's going to be a difficult place for believers. Uh, we ought to expect that. But we must be careful that we don't become like them. I think most of us have been taken back to see something of the animosity and just basic hatred that goes on in the unbelieving world. And that we can't be satisfied until we destroy those who disagree with us and so on. Um, we as believers need to be careful because that's how the world treats even others in the world. Now we're in the world, but we're not of the world. As we mentioned in our earlier study today, our citizenship is in heaven. But we are to be good citizens while we're in this world. But I realize there is a difference. I don't belong here in the way that the unbeliever belongs. I don't belong to the God small g of this world, who is the devil. And the whole world lies in his power. And he is the father of the unbeliever. We have become children of the living God. He is our father. There's going to be conflict. Jesus said we shouldn't be surprised if the world hates us. But we want to be careful that that does not become a reason or an excuse for us. To hate the world in the sense of responding like they do. They're in a payback. We see this in our political situation, you know. If we get in power, we'll pay back. Then uh, you're going to get yours. Uh, if we're not careful, that attitude, we think, well, I deserve to be treated properly. I deserve. And we become experts in the constitution of our country more than in the constitution for us as God's people. So this is what he's dealing with, beginning in verse 17. Um, and it can become very personal. And it does. It's the responsibility of the church as the church, because remember, it's addressed to the church at Rome. But the church is comprised of individuals. And we function as we should as a church corporately when individually we function as we should. And so the responsibility placed on us here. Um, he'll talk about personal responsibilities here. And he'll get into governmental responsibilities when we come into chapter 13, which become also very pertinent for us in this day. Verse 17 says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. And it's interesting, we've mentioned before, is in other languages, but in Greek, because of the form of words and so on, you don't have to put them in an order like we do in Greek, uh, in English. So you can arrange the word order to put the emphasis where you want. And what happens in verse 17 the first words that you have is to anyone. To anyone. Never pay back evil for evil. Uh, that gives you the breadth of this. Uh, it puts the emphasis on there is never an excuse or a reason that is acceptable for God for me 
to pay back evil to someone who does evil to me. You know, because I think that emphasis is important because, we, well, you know, I, I understand the general rule, but you know what happened. Do you know what they did to me? Uh, do you know how I was treated? Well, verse 17, never to anyone, and the to anyone begins it. Uh, it's never to anyone. That's pretty inclusive. I mean, that could be a difficult world to live in. Uh, a world that was unfair, unjust. I mean, Paul's so familiar with that. He's experienced. You read his testimony to the Corinthians, how many times he was beaten. Did Paul ever deserve that? Well, no. Um, the mistreatment, the abuse, you never pack, pay back evil for evil to anyone. This goes contrary to the fallen nature. We live in a get-even world. And if we're honest, we look at what happens in the political situation, if I can use it, because I know everybody has it on their mind, and you wonder, what's the outcome here? Uh, because we see this is the battleground. Uh, you think you got me, but I'm really going to get you. Pretty soon we as believers begin to think, yeah, I have rights. And I'm not just going to let these unfairnesses go by. And if I get an opportunity, there'll be payback day. Um, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. A um, couple of other passages. Come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse 15. See that no one repays another with evil for evil. Um, so no matter what they've done, that never justifies and excuses my treating them in a way that I think they deserve. I didn't do anything to them they didn't do to me. In fact, I didn't do to them even as much as they did to me. Oh, wait a minute. I have to back up. Am I a child of God or not? And I concern, you know, sometimes the problems come, and most often they come for us as believers, when we just decide we have a reason not to do what's biblical. Um... You know, this simplifies my life because, you know, I can sit and fuss and fume what I think has been done and I was treated unfairly, they'd done something, somebody did something and, you know, it's done damage and it's, but, oh, wait a minute, Lord, really, that has nothing to do. I can't control what they did. All I can do is control what I do. Um, what is my response to be? I get so taken up with what they did and how serious what they did and how unfair what they did. And Oh, wait a minute. I can't do anything about them. But I am responsible for me. What am I to do? Well, see that no one repays another with evil for evil. Always seek that after that which is good for one another and for all people. So be careful. It's not just limited to believers. I'm living in an unbelieving world. And that's why Romans uh, chapter 12 was so broad, verse 17. Not to anyone. Never to anyone do I repay back evil for evil. So we're not just talking about, well, among believers, I understand we have to treat each other and in our family. We're, but this includes the unbeliever. For one another and for all people. Come over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3. Just going through Hebrews, James, and you come to 1 Peter. And we go to chapter 3. And uh, where Peter 
writes about some of the difficulties that we have as believers. Verse 8, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit. You know, uh, sometimes I have to stop and think, is that really me? Um, Now note verse 9. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. But his face is against those who do evil. So really I am here as God's representative. Manifesting his character. What did I get from God? Mercy. Grace. uh, Kindness. Did I deserve it? No. No. Oh, yeah, but I've changed. Well, he changed me. Um, You see, in this world, we're in, I was going to say, a difficult situation, a pressure situation. The world hates us. Jesus said that. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. That's John 15, remember? So we expect that. But I don't give back what the world gives to me. I give back what God has given me to the world. And that makes me different. In that sense, a believer is hard to offend. Because what? I'm ready to forgive. I should be. So the principle, and there are other verses, but I've selected these. Come back to Romans chapter 12. I want to be careful my feelings don't overrule here. That's why the word of God has to be the ultimate authority and judge in my life. Because I can feel justified. I can feel I am right to do this. But, you know, my feelings can never overrule the word of God. When I'm in conflict with the word of God, I'm in trouble. No matter how I feel. Um, I feel I had a right. Um, I have to come to the word of God and he tells me what my rights are. And I represent him and so it's offensive to him when I misrepresent him. I think that I'll treat the world like they treat me, but he is a God of love and understanding. Now, I realize we don't want to go farther than the scripture does in this. Uh, Come back and look at Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Um. You know, the unbeliever looks at others in the world and we'll see what's going on in the conflict, which is so open. I just use that because the conflicts in our own country right now are so open. uh, And you see the back and forth. Uh, We are to be careful in all that goes on. We maintain conduct which is above reproach. Uh, some of the rioting we have, people feel justified because other people were rioting. And it seems that they get their way when they riot, so we riot and then we'll get our way. And we, one deserves another. We are to respect what is right in the sight of all men. There are certain foundational truths. And even the unbelieving world, to a certain extent, recognizes those uh, they don't have a clear perspective on it, but uh, that it's nice to be forgiving. It's good to overlook when you've been wronged. Um, come back to Proverbs chapter 3.
Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 1, my son, do not forget my teaching. Let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Note this, do not let kindness and truth leave you. Kindness, truth, in all my relationships. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Bind them around your neck. You know, it's just, that will be prominent in your life. Uh, it's always per, uh, before you. My first thought is I want to function here with kindness. I want to function in accord with his word, his truth. It's on my heart. Uh, then you'll find favor and good reputation in the sight of God and man. So that's what we're doing. The unbeliever oughtn't to be able to find any real fault in us. What did Pilate have to say about Christ? I find no fault in him. Now he's going to be unjustly treated, it is. But the testimony even of the judge from the world, I can't find any fault in him. We'll make up a case against him. But that's, we can't do anything about that. I can't do anything about the lies that may be told about me. Neither can you. If someone slanders you, you can't do anything about that except to maintain as good a reputation so that any accusations against you are false. Now, they may, quote, win the day, but there was no real truth in them. Um, and that's what we want to be concerned about. Uh, come over to Matthew chapter 5. We could have stopped in Daniel. Remember when they were accusing Daniel? You come to Matthew chapter 5, and you'll end up in the lion's dead, but they couldn't find anything wrong with Daniel except that he prayed to the living God. Well, that's a good testimony. He's going to still end up in the lion's den. Because false accusations and it was all constructed so that even the law went against him of the time. But, you know, we're going to have to catch him. Well, if they're going to say, yeah, well, we're going to trap him, we'll have to be on the basis of him having a life that adheres to the word of God. We may someday be prosecuted. Um, we were sued as a church and went to court. Um, maybe a day when uh, it's offensive to society for us to talk about a man and a woman. God's plan in marriage is between a male and a female. Some of those things we can't change. We have to just say, this is what the scripture says. But it can't be our conduct gets out of step from what it should be. It's in accord with the word of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, that doesn't mean that's always going to happen. Jesus led a perfect life and he ended up crucified. Paul led a godly life, and he ended up executed. I mean, that's not a guarantee. But that is the way. We ought to stand out from the world. Um, the world can look and say, I would have ex expected them to respond differently. But they responded, uh, you know, so graciously, so kindly. It's like they overlooked the offense. Well, we did. Um, so our conduct, even before the world, is to be good conduct. Now, they may hate us for it. They did for you. What is, you know, what's a, I'm a man who's told you the truth. But if they hate the truth, they'll hate you. Uh, well, we accept that. But we understand that. Um, come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10.
1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Whether then you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now know this. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just also as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. You know, I'm not concerned in this world about getting my just due. But Paul says, remember when he was in prison unjustly? And he wrote to the Philippian church. And he said, what? Well, my imprisonment for the cause of Christ has given me opportunity for sharing the gospel, even with the household of Caesar. I mean, this is, you, know, you don't lose perspective. Paul could have been hammering away. You know, he doesn't mind saying, I'm a Roman citizen, I have rights. When those rights are abused and taken away, Paul doesn't go to pieces. Now I am on a crusade for the Roman constitution, so to speak. And I will get my rights. I mean, I'll tell you, here I think I'm functioning consistently with the word of God and consistent with what the rules of our government are. As much as I can. Um, so we please all men. Not that we're men pleasers in the wrong sense, but the right sense. No matter what they do to me, I want to do good to them. Uh, I want to bring something of God's goodness to them so they might see in me what they won't see in a person who's not a believer. Um, you know, it's easy. We get caught up in the emotion to the time. We're bombarded with the world's way of thinking. And pretty soon we're really agitated and worked up and we're really ready to go to battle. Um, Sort of like we saw recently at our capital. What's the, what are people thinking? Would you think it was a good thing to see a Christian involved in that kind of activity? Well, he's defending the rights of the Constitution. We say no. My goodness, no. Um, but somehow people, and I'm not saying there were Christians there, but just an example. I mean, we want to be careful in our conduct personally. That all I can say is, yeah, they... I have to realize even sometimes I didn't treat them fairly, but uh, they did the best they could and were faithful and, uh, you know, never seemed vengeful, never. Uh, they just were always kind, no matter how people treated them. I mean, that's what's to characterize us. We're doing it for the glory of God. I lose sight of that and think, my rights. Um, you know, we do this stuff, but all of us battle with it. And when we've been treated unfairly and unjustly, or something goes on that really becomes personal we don't like, we can begin to unravel. And it gets to us. And I have to come back to, this is all about bringing glory to God. My, uh, my life here is for that purpose. It will soon be passed. It doesn't matter the injustices that may have been done to me. Um, I want to please all men. My real goal, whatever goes on, I might have the most mean, unkind, unjust boss, but my concern is he might come to be, you know, the Savior. And over the time I worked in the world, I had a Roman Catholic boss, then a Jewish boss. And... Uh, in the world's perspective, they were good men and they treated me right. Uh, sometimes, you know, they did dishonest things. I had to be careful I didn't do dishonest things. Well, I can't do that. That would not be honest. Uh, part of what I did was help keep the books for that business. I, I, and I'm not a, never was a, an accountant, but my responsibility entailed being responsible. I can't do that. Uh, you know and then I'd have opportunity with both the Roman Catholic and the Jewish body we could sit down and talk talk about what Christ has done 
I don't want to lose sight of what I am about here. Uh, is the character of Christ seen to all men? Come over to 2 Corinthians, and I'm not using that as an example because I always do that, but it's what I always should do. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. And Paul says in verse 4 at the end of the verse, we do not lose heart. The battle is relentless, but we can't give in. We have renounced the things hidden because of shame, but by the manifestation of truth, that's what our life is, to be a manifestation of God's truth. Uh, it's seen everywhere in all we do commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even though man is a fallen being and his conscience is defiled, it's not completely destroyed. And part of what aggravates them is when they are exposed to your life of truth, it reveals something of what they are. It's something of the light of God's word. Uh, comes into their life and for some that further antagonizes them and makes them angry which can make your life more difficult because if you will act like them they feel better about their conduct but we don't want to come to that we can't come to that because we have renounced the things hidden because of shame we don't walk in craftiness or adulterate the word of God be careful we don't want to adulterate the word of God. Mix it so that we can justify ourselves by the manifestation of truth. That ought to be what's clear about our life. It's a life of truth. And truth means we reflect God's character in kindness. Now, we hate sin. Um, we hate false doctrine. Uh, we are going to oppose that. But we are not going to oppose it in the way the world goes about it. Uh, we're going to oppose it with truth. We commit ourselves to every man's conscience. Over in chapter 8, verse 21. For we have regard for what is honorable... Not only in the sight of the Lord, but in the sight of all men. Here he's talking about how money was handled. We want to be careful um, with those things. We want to, what is it, honorable? I don't want to be able to say, well, you know, my conscience is clear on it. That's not good enough. I want to be careful that my conduct can't be doubtful. Remember the early days of the church? Uh, we've always had great people to handle uh, matters, but I never wanted to sign checks. I was always afraid, well, someday somebody may be going back through and look at an old check from years ago, see Gil's name on it, and say, I wonder what he's writing that check for. You know, I want to be careful. Um, better I don't have my name on the check. Oh, it looks like, yeah, he has his name on the check, probably writes checks for some of his personal stuff and just puts it in, and it, it's good that I'm not there. Um, like I mentioned, when I was responsible for some of the finances in the business at the time, it was one of the largest food chillers on the East Coast. And, but I would be careful. How am I going to talk about my boss, about the... The Lord and how the Lord changes a life if he finds out, you know, I've been pilfering from the cash register or something like that. I have to be careful that I do what's honorable. And not, I have to be careful of appearances. Oh, I'm careful, but yeah, I have to think about that. Not only is my conscience clear, but how will other people see this? And to the best of my ability, I want to maintain clarity on that. And we do... Come over to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Verse 12. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Now he's writing to Jewish believers. 
So as Peter, the apostle of the Gentiles, right, uh, to the Jews, writes about Gentiles, he becomes a synonym for unbelievers, those who would be most opposed to them. Not only because they're Jews, but because they're Jewish Christians now. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. So in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. And it may be in the coming judgment, there'll be people that say, you know, I came to know the Lord. I, I observed their behavior. And in the most difficult circumstances where I would have expected and I would have thought they had the right to respond in such a way, they didn't. I mean, that's what we're concerned about. Um, we're going to keep our behavior excellent. I mean, it's a reflection on the God I serve, how I behave, how I act here. Um, look down in verse 15. For such is the will of God that, uh, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men. Do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but as slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. And that's where he's going. Paul's going. And we get to chapter 12. So in all of our behavior, we're the best of citizens, the blessed of employees, the blessed, best employers, and to the best that we can. And we're going to stumble. Uh, we're going to say things we shouldn't, but we want to fix it right away. We don't want that to become a pattern and a road we go down. Um, down in chapter 3, while you're here, verse 16, then we have to move on. Keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right than for doing what is wrong. He doesn't say you won't suffer. Peter's writing, he's going to be executed unjustly. But the important thing is to maintain a testimony. Really, if even the world is honest, it didn't deserve it. Uh, the kind of, uh, and the example is Christ in verse 18. He died for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Uh, so that's the pattern. Um, While well, you're in Peter, come back to chapter 2. Um, verse 21, you've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. We're not saved by following the example of Christ, but we want the example of his character to be our example for our character. He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he offered no threats, kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. He bore our sins in his mind. He's our example. I want to be like him. So all the unfairness, injustice, and uh, we should be prepared for worse as believers in the world in which we live. We have a hard enough time. Even among ourselves, it seems like we have a hard time, and we do. But we want to grow through that. We ought to understand it. I don't want the offenses that may happen become personal. Look, I can't control anybody else. Quite frankly, so many of the times that people have come to me to complain, it's about somebody else. They usually don't come to complain about themselves because then I'm going to say, fix it. If they come to complain about someone else, I have to say, neither one of us can do anything about them. I mean, I find it helpful to keep it simple. Gil, what's your responsibility? And I have to catch myself, uh, even in my perfected state. You know, I have to stop and say, wait, Gil, what, what are you doing thinking about this? Why, why do you have those kind of thoughts? What is, I mean, does it matter what they did? What's that got to do with your response to what they did? 
uh, how are you handling this? Uh, we come to government doesn't treat us fairly. How are we going to respond? I'm going to get out the Constitution and I'm going to show them. Well, I can claim the Constitution. They may tell me that doesn't apply to your case. Too bad. And I'll say, uh, and I'll tell them what I think about them. No. I'll share with them what God's done in my life. What did Paul take the time to do before Roman uh, authorities? Share the gospel with them. Not try to point out how uh, inconsistent they were, even with the Roman law they were supposed to represent. We get caught up on things. Come back to Romans chapter 12. We haven't even gotten to the challenging passage. Maybe that's the challenging passage. Look at verse 18. If possible, so far as depends on you, be at peace with all men. That's all I can do. Again, if there's going to be a conflict, Lord, I don't want it to be my fault. As much as depends on me, I want to be at peace with all men. I am not looking for trouble. Oh, again, I want to be careful. We don't compromise truth for peace. Uh, we don't fail to address sin in the name of peace. There come a time when, and there is a time now, it is offensive to tell people that God created man as male and female. I realize that is offensive. Um, even the terminology they're attempting to erase some things I can't do anything about. So as much as depends on me. Remember, I have truth bound around my neck and in my heart, as well as kindness. I can't sacrifice one for the other. I'm going to be kind so I won't bring up the truth. Uh, but as much as depends on you, be at peace with all men. I mean, well, that's my responsibility. Now, if they don't want peace with me, I can't change them. But if there's a conflict here, it's not going to be because of them. It has to be, uh, it's not going to be because of me. It's got to be because of them. Never take your own revenge, beloved. Leave room for the wrath of God. Now note this, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You see how serious this gets. I don't want someone else's sin to become an occasion for my sin against God. I took God's place. I tried to usurp God's authority. I wanted my vengeance. God says vengeance is mine. Never take your own revenge. You know, if we really as Christians, we say we believe the word of God, if we took it at face value, never take your own revenge. You leave it. Doesn't mean justice won't be meted out. You know what the problem is? I don't know that God will take care of it. So the problem really becomes my relationship with God. I think it's their problem. It's really my problem. I'm offended. I'm upset. I'm not happy. Now we got some new little babies in our family. And you know, they'll quickly let everyone know when they're unhappy. Um, and sometimes we as believers are like that. I'm not happy. And you know, then we become a little older. We just pout. Oh, wait a minute. You never take your own revenge, beloved. And Paul's saying this out of love. He understands it's not easy, but it's not complicated. I mean, it's not that, boy, this is really hard to understand. It's not necessarily easy to implement in the situations that are most pressing. Leave room for the wrath of God. Because vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I leave it all in God's hands. Up to him. And the next verse goes with that. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. 
If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with what is good. Uh, I think these verses all go together. And they are somewhat parallel. Verse 19. Leave room for the wrath of God. Let God take care of it. Vengeance belongs to him. He's the judge. He meets out what needs to be done. So if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Uh, if he's thirsty, give him a drink. In doing so, you'll heap burning coals on his head. I take it that's talking about judgment. And on a difficult passage, all the writers acknowledge that. Sometimes it's been taken as shame and, you know, uh, a number of years ago, I thought that's probably the best way. And then try to look more at Scripture and what it says. And uh, I think what he's talking about is that's part of God's judgment. He meets out the judgment. The thing that uh, swings the case for me is when you talk about burning coals in the context of judgment, it's always a metaphor that is of judgment. Um... Leave God bring the judgment. Don't you try to bring it. That's what he's talking about. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So you do what you should do, which is be kind, be generous, um, be thoughtful. No matter what they're doing to you, he's your enemy now. If your enemy, the person is doing what he can to destroy you, if you have opportunity to do something good for him, do it. Um... God will take care of the vengeance side. That's his. That's what he's talking about. Come to several uh, passages. First, uh, 2 Samuel 22. And this is David, and he'll repeat the exact same thing in a psalm. So I'll just mention the psalm after we look at uh, 2 Samuel 22. I forgot where it was going. I was going to the psalm. 2 Samuel 22. No fair using your iPad or phone. Samuel 20. I used to be able to tell from the turning of pages whether you were there or not. 2 Samuel 22. Look at verse 9. You see here the anger of God. He started out, David speaking here. Um, verse 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. Uh, God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, uh, my Savior, you save me from uh, violence and all. Then you come down to, he cried on the Lord, and then the Lord's anger. Uh, the Lord brings judgment. Verse 8, the earth shook and quaked, the foundations of the heavens were trembling, were shaken because of his anger. Now note, smoke went out of his nostrils, fire from his mouth devoured, coals were kindred, uh, kindled. So you see that picture of coals here in the fire is a picture of God now bringing judgment, vengeance. That fits with vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So our responsibility, I want to keep a, a separation. I've had this discussion even with other pastors. We have to be careful. We don't cross the line and think it's our responsibility to meet out the judgment that God's reserved for himself. Sometimes in church discipline, there's been disagreement over this. I made out the judgment that God says, I am, if people won't repent. But we do not meet out judgment on people who say they repented. Well, what if they weren't sincere? They weren't genuine. Then God will have to take care of that. Otherwise, I think I'll step in and do what only God can do because I can't see the heart. I just don't think they were genuine. I'm not satisfied it was, it becomes another way. I'm going to go another step. I want to be careful in our lives. So you see here, coals were kindled. That seems to be fitting. It's in the context of God's judgment. Psalm 18, verse 8. You could uh, go to there. Come down to verse 13 of still in 2 Samuel 22. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. 
The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows, lightning. His judgment came. So you see, when you say you heap coals of fire on his head, that's what God's going to rain down on him. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So we do what's right. And if they haven't come to bow before God, he'll deal the judgment on them. The vengeance, because ultimately the attacks on you as a child of God are attacks against God. You are the object of their hatred because you belong to God. They will hate you because I chose you out of the world, Jesus said. So I don't want to lose that perspective. So as God's representative, I manifest his character now, which is a time of God's patience. Yeah, these are days of God giving men opportunity for salvation. His kindness. You know, I get frustrated. I, I'm ready for judgment to come sometimes when I'm... Wait, well, God will decide the time. Right now, why is God delaying his judgment? He's patient. He's not willing that any should perish. But all should come to the knowledge of the truth. If I'm not careful, I find myself thinking, I'm glad these people are going to find out what God's really like and what they really deserve. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Right now, I ought to be concerned about this is a time for them to come. The Lord's patient with them, but I can't be. The Lord is kind toward them, withholding and restraining his judgment. I can tell them about judgment to come, but I have to leave it to God to bring that judgment. Right now, I want to manifest his kindness. I want to tell you about his grace. It's true there is an eternal hell. I don't want you to go to that hell. It doesn't matter how they've been treated. Paul's in prison. He's not there holding seminars on how unjust he's been treated and how unfair the Roman system is. They don't even function according to their own uh, laws. He's there telling people about Christ. And uh, well, God put me here. So his purpose for me here is for this. When he's before Felix or another Roman authority, he's there what? Telling them about Christ and coming judgment so that he have opportunity to believe. He's before Herod, godless man. They're saying, Herod, I know. You know the scriptures. You know what I'm saying is true. I mean, let's talk about what matters. If we get off track, who's left to tell the world uh, about the saving grace? I mean, well, I'm caught up in the system. I'm ready to go to war over the injustices going on. Well, who's going to bring grace? God's patience and kindness. That's what we're reflective are. So these coals of fire, their judgment will come. Don't get ahead of God. If you will, justice delayed is justice denied. You think that's true biblically? You think anyone's going to escape God's righteous judgment? No. Well, then you just think they deserve it now. Because you deserve it. I deserve it. Wrong. All right. You can go to Psalm 18, verse 8 and 12. They quote the two verses we just read in 1 Samuel 22. Come over to Job. And then we have to wrap this up. And I have half a dozen verses, but you'll have to leave it. Job chapter 41. I think I'm going to get an iPad. Job 41, verse 20. Out of the, his nostrils, and here he's talking about God's judgment, God's justice. Uh, verse 20. Out of his nostrils smoke goes forth as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. Uh, his breath kindles coals and a flame goes forth from his mouth. So you see this picture. Uh, Proverbs Psalm 140, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 27 to 29. Ezekiel 24, 11. Uh, so come back to Romans. 
Just uh, pull this together. So when he says you'll heap burning coals on his head, every time he rejects the gospel, rejects truth. Now for some, the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, he comes to salvation. What are Paul and Silas doing? Complaining about the injustice of their beating and the pain and now here they are confined in the stocks and they're singing praise to God. And he gives opportunity then as God intervenes for them to share with the Philippian jailer. I mean, you know, we lose perspective if we let the world take over our thinking. And it starts at home. It starts in the little things. You know, the best preparation for me, if persecution will break out against Christians in our country, is to handle things as I should today. The best preparation, we saw this in Ecclesiastes, for tomorrow is today. If I don't deal with the little hurts, if I don't deal with my feelings of injustice or dislike or unfairness or whatever I don't like, today I'm not prepared for what's going to come for tomorrow. I'm losing ground. And the devil has a way of maneuvering us in what we think are the little things. One more example. You know, I was surprised that how many people were so surprised at what happened at our capital. You know how it's all? I remember talking with Marilyn and saying, you know, when they were burning buildings and cities in different places in the country, I said, you know, things get out of hand. You can't control it. It spreads. Well, where would it end up? Oh, that's the worst thing that's ever happened. That didn't deal with what it should deal with. It's the way our sin is. We tolerate what we call the little sins. It's a personal thing. It's just one-on-one. -on -one. That person, I don't like. And deal with it. I don't deal with that. I'm not prepared to deal with it as maybe the opposition gets larger, more intense. You know, we, should, we don't raise our children so that they handle things as they should when they're young. They get old and they're still handling like a two-year-old, throwing fits. Uh, you know, I have a right not to be offended. And pretty soon we're like this. I have a right not to be offended. I don't like this. I don't like the way this has worked out. Who cares? I mean, are you a believer? Do you care what God thinks? Do you care what God wants? And then it comes down to me, it's so personal. Gil, then do it. I don't want to. I don't feel like it. I'm going to sit in the corner and pout. And I'm going to let everybody know I'm unhappy. Well, then maybe I ought to stop and think, Yo, are you really a child of God? I mean, you're telling God you don't care what he wants? You don't care what he says? You're going to do what you want? We have a serious issue here. Uh, you have to resolve this before God. Really, this doesn't involve anybody else. This involves you and me. I have a problem. I don't like what you're doing. That may mean I'm not your child and there's good reason why I don't like what you're doing. I don't belong to you. I'm your enemy. Or I am your child that's going through adolescence and I'm just fighting against you and I can't do that. So we have to resolve that. The lovely thing about scripture, you know what? It just gets back. As long as it's between God and me, I can work it out with him. If it's between you and me and God, I can't do anything about you. And as long as I think it's your problem and I'm going to make it your problem, things don't get better. So when I back up and say, well, Lord, the only person I can deal with is me. 
And if I'm not being what you say I should be, it doesn't have anything to do with anyone else. It's not what they're doing or not doing. It's a matter of me responding to where you've put me, willing to be what you want me to be. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. It is clear. Lord, we want to be honest before you. And you know our hearts. You know our thoughts. We struggle with a willingness to be and do what you want us to do in these difficult situations. Thank you for the clarity of your word. Thank you for the provision of your spirit. Thank you, Lord, that by your grace we can be everything that you say we should be if we willingly submit ourselves to you. May that be true. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Just wanted to make some comments. We talked about resurrection and the resurrected body today, and that opens a lot of questions, and I had thought, you know, everything can become a series of studies, and uh, while I was gone, I was working through some of this and uh, had thought about doing uh, a mini-series on it, but I just want to make some comments uh, about related matters to the resurrection body. And one of the issues is, what about the time between our death and our resurrection? Uh, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So there'll come a time, if Christ doesn't come, when we will experience physical death and we will move out of our bodies and into the presence of the Lord. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're not going to look at a lot of verses, but uh, this is a foundational passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul seems to be dealing with the fact, you know, a lot of his emphasis on we're looking for the coming of the Lord. But in this passage in 2 Corinthians, he faces the reality that I may die. And that always was a reality to him. But sometimes it, impre- you know, it comes to us more. If you go through a difficult illness or a disease, or you get old, you, you function uh, and recognize these things more. And it was more. You know, now at my advanced age, there's more of a chance that I won't get to the rapture. And sometimes in my prayers, I wouldn't say I remind the Lord, but I talk to the Lord about it. Lord, if I'm going to get to go in the rapture, it's going to have to be sooner than later. Um, I prefer that. That's what I'm really anticipating. But obviously at my age, I don't have as much time for the rapture as someone who's 20. They may have the next 60 years that the rapture could come in. Chances of me getting to be 140 are... Slim. So here Paul's talking about verse 16 of chapter 4. We do not lose heart. Though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for, producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. That's what we were talking about. Glory is our future. Uh, compared to the eternal weight of glory... The afflictions of this life are momentary and light. And I don't want to make light of them. You know, they can seem overwhelming. And, uh, you know, almost are for us at times. But when you compare that to the eternal weight of glory, (laughs) they're nothing. The fact that Paul was so persecuted and ultimately executed... He's had 2,000 years of the glory of God's presence and really he hasn't even gotten started because he didn't get his resurrection body yet. And he faces that reality. And this is true for us because we look at things, not at things which are seen, but things which are not seen. Verse 18, key verse. Once we stop walking by faith and walking by sight, things unravel in our lives. We have to walk by faith. I believe what the word of God says. Uh, The things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. 
For we know if our earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down. He's talking about our physical body. If it's going back to dust, it's pictured like a tent, a house we live in, a temporary structure. That's why he calls it a tent. Uh, A temporary house. That's what this physical body is in its present state. You know, I can't outlive it. Uh, It's a temporary house. Will I make 80? I don't know. But, you know, will I make 200? No. Um, It's a temporary. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not found to be found to be naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now, some have taken from this passage to mean we get a temporary body, so that when we die... And our spirit leaves this body, we get a temporary body. We don't want to be unclothed. So God gives us a temporary body until we get our physical body resurrected. I don't think that's what this passage is talking about. Paul's talking about my ultimate desire is not death when I leave this body. My ultimate desire is to be clothed with my glorified body. That's why he's talking about the things which are not seen are eternal. Um, It's characterized by glory. Uh, It's the body God's prepared for me, which is like the body of Christ. Remember, our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3. And when he comes, he'll transform this body into conformity with the body of his glory. Now, in between... We are disembodied spirits. I mean, Paul's been dead for 2,000 years. His body has disintegrated and gone back to dust. But he's living in the presence of God as a spirit. Well, what is that? Oh, remember, angels were created as spirit beings. They are ministering spirits. Hebrews chapter 2 tells us angels are ministering spirits. They never did have a physical body. They never will have a physical body, but they can function as spirits. They have an identity. They're just not this, you know, cloud-like substance. In fact, and we don't have time to go there, but uh, back in... Genesis chapter 18. You can go back and read that. Not now. Um, The first eight verses. Remember Abraham. Three men come to him. And they're angelic creatures. One probably being the pre-incarnate Christ. The angel of uh, Jehovah. The angel of the Lord. Uh, They come. And we know that two of them are regular angels. Because they will go on to Sodom and Gomorrah. To bring judgment. Rescue Lot and bring judgment. Do you know what they do? Abraham invites the three to sit down and have dinner. So he goes out, picks out the best of the herd, gives it to Sarah, who gives it to the servants. And uh, Marilyn still thinks our house ought to function like that, but it doesn't. Um, It stops with her. Um, They prepare the meal. And uh, they have curds and milk and meat. And they sit down, and you know what it says? Those three men ate. You know what it means? Angels are spirit beings. They can eat food too. Because they sat down and ate the meal, and then went on their way. The third, who is the pre-incarnate Christ, stays to have conversation with Abraham and reveals something of his deity and the power he has. Uh, So spirit beings are real beings. When they appear, and I went through, but we don't have time to look at some of those, but when Gabriel appears, for example, he appears as a man. Sometimes it says there was a man. Daniel says, I saw a man standing there. And it'll later say it was Gabriel. 
the angel. Well, it wasn't a physical man, but he is manifest. So I take it when we get to heaven, if I would die tonight of a heart attack, my spirit, the body without the spirit is dead. To be absent of our body is to be present with the Lord. Um, Paul goes on to that in chapter 5 of Corinthians here where we were. Uh, Therefore, being always of good courage, knowing while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We are of good courage and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But that's not the final. I look forward to that, but my final goal is the redemption of the body. I take it in our spirit, we will be identifiable. Um, we'll recognize each other. Even as spirit beings, we don't lose our identity. We can be seen for who we are. Uh, like Gabriel could be seen. He didn't have to be seen, but he could be. And he manifested himself. I take it when he's in the presence of God in heaven, the angels all appeared. They have their individual identity. Um, so, you know, I can't say more than God says, but I take it we have our full identity as persons. We're not just, we are not clothed with this physical body. But we are conscious, aware, alive. Um, function is, we could function in the presence of God in glory. We'll know our loved ones. Um, you know, that's what glory will be. So we have our identity. Just like you don't have to have the body to have the identity, but as physical beings, God created us to be embodied. So as we talked about this morning, the body is permanent. But we can live outside the body. We speak with a couple of our believers who passed away uh, just this week. They left their body. Their body is put in a grave. They're in the presence of the Lord. Fully alive and aware. I mean, the angels have all awareness. They are personal beings. I mean, Gabriel could say when uh, the authority of what he said to Zacharias regarding the birth of John and Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, said, well, how do I know these things are true? What does Gabriel say? I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. I mean, what do you mean, how do you know what I say is true? I come from the very presence. He has identity, and he's not everywhere. He is a being. He can, you know, he's not bound by time. Uh, as a spirit being. So that's something we have to look forward to. So I take it, loved ones uh, that have passed on, believers, they're enjoying great fellowship in heaven. We saw the martyrs pictured in the book of Revelation under the throne. They're asking God, when will you avenge our blood? That will come, God says, in his time. It's not yet time. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. But they have an identity. Uh, they are who they are. Uh, one more example, and this is Samuel, and you can read about it. First uh, Samuel 28. Remember, Saul went to the witch of Endor and asked her to call up Samuel, and Samuel does appear, and Saul doesn't see him, but the witch does. And Samuel says, why have you disturbed my rest? And now Saul can talk to Samuel. He has identity. Uh, but his body hasn't been resurrected. Uh, yeah, it's a unique case. Um, but he has his, still his identity. The witch of Endor could describe Samuel. This is what he looks like, because Saul couldn't see him. And Saul said, it's Samuel. I mean, so even in his spirit uh, condition, he is identifiable. 
Um, so I take it between all the believers who have died, how many that are in glory now? Um, they have a, none of them have received glorified bodies except Christ. That goes all the way back to Adam. But they have an identity. Remember Abraham? God is the God of Abraham, and he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Abraham's alive today. Not in his body, but in his spirit. So I can't tell you much more about the spirit, but it's who we are within. And this body is a cloak, but this body is eternal. But don't make more of that than God does. What is special about it is he's going to recreate it, this body, with glory. Uh, so just to fill in that gap, since I'm like Paul, I'm getting closer to that point. Uh, I'm more interested in it. Well, my spirit leaves the body. I want to know. I'll be in the presence of the Lord. I will. And I'll be identifiable. I look forward to meeting my parents, others that uh, will. And then I look forward to meeting Abraham um, and so on. You can look forward to that too. But I'm hoping for the rapture. That's the best. Because uh, the last enemy is death. And it will be an enemy and it won't be resolved until death is done away. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, the riches of your word. Pray these truths will encourage our hearts, strengthen us. Lord, pray we'll fix our minds on them, bind them around our neck, fill our heart with them. And Lord, may they guide our conduct, our thinking, and our behavior in the weeks before us. Uh, use us to bring the gospel to those we come in contact with. Uh, may we show patience and kindness as a reflection of your patience and kindness in these days of salvation, all that you might be honored. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.